Well, good morning and happy new year. Uh, if we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Terry Lee. I'm one of the pastors here at the Oaks. I want you to know that whether you are a first-time guest with us or you call the Oaks Church home, I am so grateful uh, that of all the different places that you could have chosen to spend your time this Sunday morning, you're here uh, to worship with God's people and to hear from God's Word. So if you have your copy of the Bible, go ahead and find Romans 5. We're jumping back to Romans, and then we'll kind of change it up next week. I'm really excited about that. But uh, since this is a sermon that I was really excited about, pre-COVID, I get to preach it today. And so we're going to be finishing up Romans chapter 5. Now, as you find Romans chapter 5, you know, as I said, the whole Kirkland family kind of had this COVID experience through Thanksgiving. We were stranded in Florida for a little bit because we got it there whenever we were with with family. You're probably already wondering, okay, how many COVID stories, analogies, illustrations am I going to have to endure over the next couple months slash years? And I want to say that I think my near-death experience earned me like two a month. So I don't don't know. Uh, Maybe we'll do some feedback afterwards or or something like that. But, you know, I mean, uh, all all seriousness um, and all joking aside, I mean, there was a moment in time that that virus felt forever away from me. I remember first hearing the words patient zero. And not really thinking anything of it because it was in another country, right? It was just kind of a news headline. Think back to 2019, right? We heard uh, the, the concept that there was a person with a virus and it was patient zero and it was very serious. But with everything else going on in our lives, we really didn't think much about it. And I'm not trying to be dismissive to people who were tragically affected in those early days. I'm just kind of being honest about my personal experience. There was a day that... Patient zero became very real to me. There was a day that my wife, Abby, texted me and said, our one-year-old, Charlie, just tested positive, and he's, he's not looking too good. There was a day that the effects of patient zero felt very near to me whenever I rolled out of bed after I had tested positive a few days earlier. I couldn't catch my breath, and I started coughing, flipped on the light, and what I realized is that my own blood was in my hand and on the floor. You see, the the effects of that virus felt really near to me uh, whenever I was laying in a hospital bed and hooked up to an IV, not really knowing what the days ahead would hold. You see, what what took place in in patient zero, I I became affected by within my own rib cage. It was no longer just kind of a Twitter post or maybe a controversial issue to try to figure out, okay, how, how should we handle this? No, the effects of patient zero were at work within me and drawing me closer to death. And what Romans 5 is about is that there is a spiritual patient zero that has infected us all. There was a spiritual patient zero named Adam in the Garden of Eden. And in his sin, he introduced a virus to the world that would spread to every single other person that existed. That because of his failure, humanity fell. All has been destroyed. Creation began to unravel. And it would take one to restore what he had destroyed. You see, sin is the reason that, that the world is corrupted. Sin, sin is the reason that life rarely feels like it looks in the picture that we put on our Christmas card. Sin is the reason that some of us have had friends that and sought to take their own life in the past year. Sin is the reason that, that sometimes we can be so selfish in our marriages. Sin is the reason that we can be so overconsumed with work that we neglect real friendships, the things of the Lord in our family that matters. And our only hope is that what one man destroyed, another, the God man, would come and completely restore. So we have Romans 5. 12 through 21 before us this morning. And the message of Romans 5, 12 through 21 is this, that one man's failure brought humanity's fall, but the God-man's life brings life to many. Now, I know that we've had an entire sermon series since we last talked about the book of Romans, so let's just kind of do a quick recap. Uh, The letter to the church in Rome is called Romans. It was written by the Apostle Paul. 
gospel. Now, he wrote this letter for two reasons. Uh, one, he's writing to remind them of the gospel, and he's also writing to prepare a visit that he hopes to make in the future. Now, the first three chapters of Rome kind of sit heavy on us, if you remember, because Paul is really trying to convince us that there is a God who is holy, who created all things, rules all things, and we were created to be in right relationship with him. But because of our sin, we are separated from him. We now live under the wrath of God. And then at the end of chapter 3, things begin to get a little bit brighter. And so chapter 3 through where we'll be today is kind of this beautiful concept that because Christ came and fulfilled the commands of God that we broke in our place, that if we trust in him, if we trust in his substitutionary death on the cross on our behalf to take our punishment, and in his resurrection that brings life, that we can have life in him. The word that Paul uses again and again is that we can be justified, declared righteous before a holy God based upon the works of another. We can have a vibrant, joy-filled, at-peace relationship with God because of the work of Christ. And so as we get into Romans 5, 12 through 21, we kind of get to look under the hood of justification and see, okay, like what's the logic here? How does this make sense? Like if anybody is thinking or has ever thought, like, is the gospel too good to be true? Or are there just some things that perhaps don't add up to where, you know, whenever I finally breathe my last breath in this life and stand before God, like, is there going to be something that I missed? I mean, this passage really answers a lot of questions that I think is just a lot of fun. So I'm excited to get into it. And before we do that, I want to just read verses 12 through 21 with you. This is what we read. Chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore... Just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Now, right there, and we're just going to look at verses 12 through 14 to begin with. And what we see is sin's introduction, the curse and its consequences. Now, verse 12 begins with an instructive word. We read, therefore... And any time you hear or see a biblical author using the word therefore, they're telling you to look in the rearview mirror, right? Where have you been? What did you just read? And go back to that because the argument is building here. And so what Paul said in verses 1 through 11, he's going to provide the logic for in verses 12 through 21. Now think about the verses that Hunter just read. If you didn't listen to Jimmy's sermon, maybe you weren't here, you're Little Oaks on Romans 5, 1 through 11. Go back and listen to it. Perhaps encouraging sermons that has been preached at the Oaks. Because, I mean, Paul just kind of goes through these benefits of the gospel. He says, because you have trusted in Christ, you have peace with God. You have access to God constantly, 24-7 in prayer. You can have joy in suffering. You can have hope in trial. You can have salvation that preserves you, although you deserve the wrath of God. These benefits of the gospel. Right? That's why we call the gospel the good news. But perhaps someone is sitting there. Maybe you even have this question as you think through it. Right? How can what one person did be applied to billions of people who have trusted in him? You ever thought about that? Like, how could, how could what Christ did in his incarnation, his perfect obedience, in his death and in his resurrection just be applied to everyone who trusted in him? Is that logical? Is that possible? And Paul is going to say, yes. In fact, there is a time that God used this very same concept. In fact, he created a precedent with the very first person that he created for the one to represent the many. That's why he's going to call Adam a type here, because Adam held a very unique relationship to humanity while he was in the garden. He was our representative head. And so here Paul is going to provide the logic to say, yes, God has done it, so that where Adam failed, there would be a second Adam, a new Adam, and where the first Adam failed, the law would be fulfilled in the second Adam. 
that one who got everything wrong would set the stage for the one who would come and get everything right. And he is the son of God. But I'm getting ahead of myself, right? Because we're not there yet in this text. That's like chapter, or page five of my notes. I'm already there. Um, just as sin came into the world. Now, what is, what is Paul talking about? When did sin come into the world? Well, here, here he's setting up this comparison to the moment that sin came into the world. Now, this is just going to be a quick aside because we don't have time to get fully into it. But the entire arg- argument of Paul falls apart here if you think that Adam and Eve are just metaphorical, figurative people, right? If, if Jesus, the one who is our Savior of the world, took on flesh to fulfill this as the one who represents literally, then we, we must say that who we are talking about in Genesis 3 that brought sin into the world, that one man is a literal, physical person, uh, not just kind of a story that was created so that we can understand how things got wrong in the world. No, this is, these are literally people that God created, Adam and Eve. And so what is Paul talking about here? Well, he's referring back to the garden, In verse 12, he says that just as sin came into the world through one man, and he's referring to those opening pages of your Bible that you'll read this week as you're going through this reading plan. Now, I'll be quick here, but I think it's worth summarizing what took place. Right? God created these people to live in communion with him, to have a unique relationship with him in this perfect place in the Garden of Eden. And God gave them one command, to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, what took place? The serpent who disregarded God's command, uh, the mouthpiece of Satan, he comes and he begins to speak to Eve. He begins to plant lies and uh, disregard the word of God. And he says, well, you know, I mean, surely if you eat of it, nothing will happen, you know. And what happens? Eve falls into temptation. In her free will, she eats. And then Adam is just kind of standing there idly by, not being any kind of leader in the home. And you know, then he takes a bite as well. And then what happens? Sin enters the world. Everything is fractured. They drastically underestimated what would take place when they disregarded the command of God. That bite of that forbidden fruit sent a shockwave through humanity that changed the very fabric of our souls. You see, whenever sin entered the world, it, it created a fracture in four different relationships. This is helpful for us to understand, okay, what what are the actual effects of sin? Those four relationships that are affected by sin are our relationship with God, with one another, with the world, and with ourselves. Our relationship with God is fractured because he is a holy God, right? They were created to live in relationship with him, in communion with him, and yet he is a holy God, and now they are sinners. And so they are separated. And because we all take on that corrupt nature Uh, given to us, inherited by Adam as those who come from him, guess what? Now our default state when we enter this world is separated from God. Second, it it fractures our relationship with one another. Immediately, Adam blames Eve, right? He says, hey, God, the woman that you gave me is the one who messed everything up. What do they do? They begin to hide from one another. They used to be unashamed, and now they're trying to clothe themselves with fig leaves. You see, sin fractures our relationships with one another. Sin is really the seed of conflict. It is the seed of isolation. It is the reason that racism and prejudice and gossip exist in our world. They are the ripple effects of sin. It's the reason that we just kind of try to like form clicks with people that are in our same life stage or the reason that we're judgy about other people. It's the reason that we try to isolate ourselves to keep from getting hurt. Sin has created a rift in our relationships with one another. Sin has also distorted the way that we view the world. Uh, to work in the world, uh, to bring us joy. And yet, one of, the, one of the aspects of the curse is that God says that the, the ground that Adam worked would now yield thorns and thistles. It w- wouldn't be easy. It would be full of toil. This is the reason that there is suffering in the world that we live in. This is the reason that we often create unhealthy relationships with the gifts that God gives us. And fourth and finally, sin breaks our relationship with ourselves. We were created as, as those in the image of God, to be image bearers of God. And yet, we often forget that we were created for the glory of God, and we become self-centered and self-absorbed and forget that we were created for the glory of another. 
Or perhaps that distortion for you is kind of a different tendency. And so uh, you just kind of sink into this idea that I'm, I'm not valuable. I don't matter. It doesn't matter uh, what I do. Nobody cares about me. And we forget that we were created in the image of God. And that is what gives us intrinsic value because his fingerprints are upon us. And so sin has broken all of these relationships. Now, I want to kind of take this from like, okay, Genesis 3, doctrine of sin, and ask you, which one of these relationships is creating the most pain in your life right now? Presently, right? Is it that you've neglected your relationship with God because something temporary and fleeting has caught your eye? You feel far from him. Maybe, maybe you wandered in today and you're like, man, maybe 2022 is the year I get it right. Could it be a strained relationship with, with another person? And you know that, man, even if it's a little, you're, you're at fault and you're just kind of pushing that aside and you're like, man, I don't, I don't want to do this. Maybe for you, it's an unhealthy relationship with something in the world. It could be an addiction. It could be running to food for comfort. It could be that you're overworking because, man, it's honestly sometimes it's so much easier to figure out things at work than it is at home. Like what, what is it? For you? Is it your view of self, an obsession with your self image? Or maybe you define yourself by a sin that has been committed by you or a sin that you have committed and you're just like, this is who I am, and you've forgotten that you're created in the image of God. Now, I want to linger here for the sake of what the Holy Spirit might be doing in your life. Is there something maybe that you would just write down right now if you're a note taker? Something you'd say, I'm going to commit this to prayer. This is something the Holy Spirit is kind of bringing to light right now, something I need to confess an area that I really need to trust God for right now. You see, we, we feel the effects of sin. I can list out these four relationships, but let's be honest, you're able to kind of give specifics for every single one of them as I talk about them. And what we experience as normal, I mean, think about it, Adam and Eve, they remembered what they lost. They remember the day that sin entered into the world. I mean, I think about it like whenever I went back home to Panama City, a lot of you guys know I grew up in Panama City, Florida. That was my hometown. I remember going back after uh, Hurricane Michael had come, this Cat 5 hurricane, sustained 160 miles per hour wind. And I had vivid memories of the place that I grew up. And I remember driving home from the airport to my parents' house and just seeing like high school gymnasiums that I played in that looked like junkyards of twisted metal. Pavement was ripped up off the highway, acres of trees that once existed was now barren land. Everything changed because of one storm that came through. And what I experienced in some part pales in comparison to what Adam and Eve experienced. They had life with God, a joy-filled peace with God. And when sin entered the world, all of that was changed. And that's what we experience apart from God. You see, there was a moment in which Adam experienced the darkest depth of the sin that he introduced to the world. Uh, we keep reading and we see that sin entered through one man, that death came through sin, and that death spread to all men. See, there was a day that Adam, after they had had these two sons, Cain and Abel, goes out to the field where they had been working. He calls out, Cain, Abel, nobody comes. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, he's calling out their name. And normally, normally they come, right? And he knew they often fought. I mean, boys will be boys, right? So he decides to walk through the field. And his eyes fall upon something that is every parent's worst. He has his own children. Beside him was the weapon used to take his own to take his life at the hand of his own brother. And as he laid there weeping with his child in his arms, looking at Abel, he realized this is what sin does. Sin brings death. Sin brings destruction. Take it from me, right? Sin brings pain. Sin brings regret. Sin brings guilt, shame, fear. And you guys know that. I don't have to convince you that sin brings harm and destruction. And Adam experienced the reality that we read in verse 12, that sin brings death and death spread to all men. Now, I think it's important here 
kind of still in the early stages of developing the concept and theme of the sermon to think about what is death. It's worth defining death because death is an aberration to God's design. It is an unwanted intruder to the way that God had originally designed Adam and Eve. It's the result of sin. And whenever we think about death, I think we often think of physical death, right? Uh, We're surprised whenever we read in Genesis 2.17, God gives the command, God always keeps his word. He, He says, the day that you eat of this tree, you will surely die. And what happens? Eve takes a bite. Adam follows, takes a bite. They're still breathing. They were like, what happened here? Well, death takes on two forms. And so, and as someone like reading the Bible, it's really important to realize there, that death takes on two forms. There's a physical death and there is spiritual death. So let's define these. Physical death is when your soul is separated from your body. So your heart stops beating, your brain ceases to function, and yet the soul that God created is an everlasting soul that is within your, within your body. And so your soul will go on forever. Your soul will exist either in the presence of God or separated from God in an eternal place called hell forever. So physical death is whenever your body and your soul are separated and you breathe your last breath on earth. It's possible also to be physically alive but spiritually dead. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, spiritual death is whenever your soul is separated from God. So think about that for a moment. That means that you can be physically alive and yet spiritually dead because spiritual death has nothing to do with your brain functioning or your heart beating. No, spiritual death is whenever your soul is separated from God. And so on that day in the garden, whenever Adam and Eve took that forbidden fruit, at that moment, you're spiritually dead. The immediate consequence from this curse was spiritual death, separated from God. And God, in his kindness and mercy, he would slay an animal. He would set up this pattern of atonement. He would cover them with that skin. And in a way, they would have a renewed relationship with God. But it would be forever changed. And so they experienced immediate spiritual death. And yet their physical death would be gradual and progressive throughout their life. And one day, there would be a funeral for them, right? And and so as we see these two different kinds of death, uh, we see that is what was introduced into the world, both a spiritual and a physical death through Adam. Now, here's a question that may be bothering you at this point. We read verse 12. The death spread to all men because all sinned. And somebody's thinking, like I was whenever I read this, I wasn't there, right? I wasn't in the Garden of Eden. What does this mean? Because Adam sinned, all sinned? Like, what gives this guy the right to, for, for me to take on his credit for messing things up? Why is Adam's problem my problem? I mean, we live in this individualistic culture. We have this Western mind, right? We don't want anybody to be able to kind of determine what happens in our life. And yet we often live like this because whenever the president declares war on another country, guess what? As American citizens, we are now at war with that country. Uh, Whenever, uh, think about football, whenever a linebacker goes off sides, who's penalized? That one guy? No, the, the entire team suffers from his wrongdoing. And and so what God has done here is he established a relationship that would exist as long as Adam was in the garden that was a relationship that the theology, the doctrine behind it is called federal headship, where Adam could act as a representative, where he could be the federal head for all humanity in his obedience or disobedience, and in his free will, he chose to disobey God. And that then represented all humanity. Therefore, because Adam's sin, we have all sin because he was our representative. God is establishing a pattern here so that the one can impute his actions, account to others what he has done. Now, maybe you're still like, I don't like this, okay? I'm right, I I, I can get that. And so let me give you two reasons to chill out or to consider. First, think about how you would have handled this situation. Do you think that you would have handled that moment in the garden any differently than Adam or Eve did? Do you really think, based upon your daily life, 
that you would have just kind of emerged victorious from that moment. Adam and Eve, uh, they, they did not have a sinful nature yet, so we'll give them that. But you are someone who has trusted in Christ, and you're now indwelled with the presence of God through the Holy Spirit, and you still sin every single day. So if we're honest with ourselves, we know that we wouldn't have just kind of puffed our chest out and you know, told the serpent to go away in that moment. We would have given in as well. Every single day, we give a time stamp to specifically what Adam did representatively. Okay, the second reason that you can consider this is because this moment in the garden is actually to your benefit. If, if you kind of do away with this idea of federal headship, you slam the door on Adam representing you, then you also rule out the possibility that one could represent you who actually gets things right, which is kind of the linchpin of Paul's entire argument here. Now, I know that this has been a lot, so we're just going to kind of move through verses 13 and 14 really quickly. We're kind of setting up everything that we're going to see here in the remainder of these verses. So as we look at verses 13 through 14, we read, For sin was indeed in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Now, people are saying, okay, well, if death entered through sin because Adam had that one command that he and then it seems like there, doesn't, there aren't any specific commands until the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments are given, then why did people die in the in-between? Well, one, we have the natural law written on our hearts in our conscience, and we have sinned against that. Every person in between sinned against that natural law that God gave through the conscience. But Paul is also saying there's a unique recognition of sin that came once the Mosaic law was given. We'll see Paul talk about that more in Romans chapter 7. It's simply what he's saying is that death reigned. Right? The consequence of sin went on. That's why you see things like the flood taking place. Verse 14, Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. They didn't have that same specific command like he did, who was a type of the one to come. This is what we've been saying, that Adam is a type. Give the command to either obey or disobey, and being a representative of the many who would come after him. The second thing that we'll see as we go through Romans five is a comparison. There's a comparison given between the cause of sin and death and the conqueror of sin and death. Let's look at verses 15 through 17. We read this. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's trespass or that one man's sin. For the judgment following one man's trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following man, many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned, through that one man much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. See, at first, what Paul is doing in verses 12 through 14 is he's setting up the precedent for the one representing the many. In verses 15 through 17, Paul is comparing uh, kind of these two different um, people and, and what they introduce to the world. So the first thing that we see in verse 15 is that there is a trespass and a free gift that are compared to one another. That's exactly what Paul says here. The free gift is not like the trespass. Well, what was the trespass? It was Adam's sin. What is the free gift? It is grace. It is being justified. Why does Paul call it a free gift? Because we do not do anything to earn the grace of God. Death, we earn through our sin, through our corrupt nature. Our salvation, we've done nothing to earn. You didn't do anything to earn any of the Christmas gifts that you received this year. If you would have opened up something and you said, oh, is this because I wash the dishes every week? Is this because I, I took out the trash on, you know, like a daily basis? That would be really offensive to the person that gave you that gift. No, it is a free gift to receive. And in the same way, our salvation, that free gift is because of the work of another. Here we see the reversal of the effects of death and sin. Christ restores what sin and death has broken. Jesus takes that spiritual death and he creates communion with God. He, he helps us, he gives us the ability to enter into a relationship with God. 
He renews those effects of the fall. And one day, there will be a day that our bodies are completely glorified and that our soul is united back to a restored body where we dwell in the presence of God forever. Think about that. The free gift is not like the trespass. It brought death to many. Jesus brings life to many. There will be a day that those beeping machines in the ICU are replaced with the blast of a trumpet. There will be a day that the blind are able to describe the color of their children's eyes, that the quadriplegic runs without growing weary. There will be a day that funeral homes are converted into coffee shops and ice cream parlors. There will be a day that death is a distant memory because of what Christ has done. This this is a free gift. Salvation, eternal life now with God and restored creation is nothing like the trespass. Christ restores all that sin has stolen. The next contrast is condemnation and justification. Look at verse 18. He says, The free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one man's trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. What do we see here? That we... Even on our best days, because of our sin, we deserve condemnation, right? Our sin has separated us from a holy God, and yet the free gift brings justification, being declared righteous and holy before God. Now, as you consider our condemnation, we have to reflect for a moment. There are no exceptions to this. Uh, There is this, this concept called original sin, which means we inherit the guilt of Adam, right? We inherit the guilt of that original sin. But not only that, we're also totally depraved. We now have a corrupt nature. Our spiritual compass does not point north. It points every single other direction because we have inherited kind of that nature that Adam and Eve introduced in the garden, This is why Ephesians 2.1 says that we are born dead in our trespasses and sins. The moment that your parents signed your birth certificate, although you were breathing, you were spiritually dead. And that's why we need a Savior. Our sin is so intertwined with our DNA that the only way to save us from our sin is for us to be somehow born again. And that's exactly what happens in Christ. There's a story of St. Augustine in his Confessions where Uh, He tells the story about his childhood where he used to just steal pears off his neighbor's pear tree just to throw them in the ditch or feed them to the hogs. He said, "I I just did bad just because I wanted to, right? That's that concept of just being totally depraved. And maybe you have your own stories that you could write about that very exact thing. He says, it was foul and I loved it. I loved my own undoing. That brings condemnation. But the great reality is that against that backdrop of darkness, a ray of hope breaks through. That there is one who put to death, death. And he did it through his own death. So that we might live. So that Romans 8.1 could say that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So you can take those putrid thoughts and actions that bring you great shame and you can nail them against the cross of Christ to bear them no more. The reality that you are justified means that the throne room of God, the place where the very angels God created quake in the presence of God, is a place that you can enter right now in prayer and call the God of the universe Father. You're justified. You have life in Christ. The comparison in verse 17 is death and life. For because of one man's trespass, death reigned. Through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. There are a few contrasts that are more stark than death and life. Right? It's like light and dark. And this is actually one of the areas that we find the Greek very helpful. And typically, whenever you see the word life used, or oftentimes it can be the word bios, where we get our word biology from, because it's the study of living organisms, right? Physical life. But here, Paul uses a different word. He uses the word zoe which represents our eternal life in relationship with God. And he says that in life, you reign. Whenever, you're, whenever you are in relationship with Jesus, you pass from this death spiritually to having zoe, a relationship with God. This is the exact word that John uses in John 1.4 whenever he says, in Christ was life, and the life, the zoe, was the light of man. 
This means that the life that Christ gives is comprehensive. Let me challenge you with this for a moment in a way that I needed to be challenged as I studied this because Romans 5 is unbelievably practical here. Your relationship with Christ changes everything and you can't compartmentalize the gospel. You see, if Jesus is Lord of your life, you will love your spouse sacrificially in the way that Christ loves his church. If you are informed by the word of God, then your words will be used for building others up, speaking truth in love. See, we can't compartmentalize the gospel because now all of life, Zoe, has been changed that we would live differently. The third and final thing that I want you to see in Romans 5 is two categories. That you are either in Adam or you are in Christ. That you are either in Adam or you are in Christ. Look at verses 18 through 21 with me. We read, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And here we see that this affects all men. Whether you were sitting in first century Rome as someone read this letter aloud, or you are sitting right here at the Madisonville Rec Center, this applies to you or affected. All humanity was affected, and so death grows closer to us all. The reality of spiritual death, the reality of physical death, it doesn't matter what Snapchat filter you use or how many wrinkle creams you have, you are closer to death right now than you were when I started the sermon. Happy New Year, right? And yet, we see that there is a representative, that all men who were in Adam inherit death. And yet all who are in Christ receive life. Now, this is important because as you read this, you might accidentally read, okay, so everyone is now saved because of what Christ did. No, that's not what Paul is saying. That's a heresy called universalism, that now just everybody will one day end up in heaven because of what Christ did. No, what Paul is saying here is that all people who are represented in Adam will inherit the consequence of what Adam did. And all people who are in Christ who are represented by Christ will receive the fate that he purchased, which is eternal life in his name. Uh, Jesus is the only one who is able to save us. He's the only one who took on flesh, who fully fulfilled God's commands. He is the only one who didn't inherit a sinful nature because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He is the one mediator, the God-man, Christ Jesus, who can give us life. Verse 19 continues to say that that we are made righteous, declared righteous through this one man's obedience. Verse 20 fixes something that perhaps some of the Jews in that day would have gotten wrong. They would have said, yes, God gave us the law so that we would know how to live so we could fix ourselves. And what Paul says is that, no, God gave you the law to show you that you need fixing. And there was only one that can do it. And yes, now that you are a new creation filled with the Holy Spirit, you live in a way that is informed by the law, but you are not under the weight of the law because you can't bear it. And so here we're given this choice, right? To be in Adam or to be in Christ. And the choice is yours, right? Verse 21, that in Christ, there's righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Eternal life is found whenever Christ is Lord over your life. You can choose. In Adam, there's condemnation, there's death. And there is separation from God. But in Christ, grace, righteousness, and an eternal relationship with him are yours for the taking. So which will you choose? You see, the effects of our spiritual patient zero are upon us all. And yet, where Adam failed, Christ has prevailed. You see, the first man disobeyed the single command of God. And the Son of God, the God-man, obeyed every single word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Adam failed at a tree. And yet Jesus fulfilled what was needed for our salvation upon a tree. In the Garden of Eden, Adam introduced sin to the world. And in the Garden of Golgotha, Jesus put sin to death, emerging from a tomb to offer life to the world. There is only life found in Christ. 
And so let me ask you these two diagnostic questions as we close. As you consider what we've talked about this afternoon or this morning, are you dead? Are you spiritually dead? Maybe you'd sit there and you think, I, I don't know. I, I struggle with a lot of doubt. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not certain. Perhaps this verse would be helpful to you from 1 John 5, 11, and 12. It says, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Do you have the Son? Have you said, you know what, I need to repent of my sins. I can't figure this out. I need the death of Christ in my place, his resurrection to give me life. I need his righteousness to have life in his name and to have a relationship with God. Second question, are you alive but suffering from sin's symptoms? The symptoms of sin are fear, shame, and guilt. Do you fear the future? Are you fearful? Do you have shame from, from sins that you've committed or sins committed against you? Do you walk around with guilt whenever you give your life to Christ? There is no more fear. Trust can replace fear. Confidence can replace your shame, and Christ's righteousness can replace your guilt. And so as we take communion together, maybe you make this a matter of prayer. You just ask God, how do I respond in this moment? Because yes, sin and death have come through Adam, but life comes through Christ. Let's pray.